Welcome, everyone. Um, really wonderful to see you all this morning and your, your beautiful faces. Um, thank you for joining me today for this exciting uh, virtual um, uh, event where uh, Vicki Jensen will be doing a brief talk and um, a slideshow presentation um, at the re-release of, um, of her book, Totem Pole Carving, Norman Tate bringing a log to life the second edition this is the book it's an excellent book new cover as well and i hope that this will be um the first of many for us um in uh in the virtual world um my name is svetlana fuchs and i am the founder and co-owner of coastal people's gallery in vancouver canada um and as one of the long-standing First Nations and Inuit galleries in Vancouver since 1996. We've had the great privilege of knowing countless of master, mid-career and new generation artists um, and new generation artists who have inspired us with, uh, you know, their stories, their artworks, and more importantly, their friendships. Um, I know that uh, Vicky can speak to that too. Uh, Norman Tate was one of those artists whose masterful masks totems, jewelry, and graphics um, complemented our diverse collection from the Pacific Northwest Coast region of the Nass Valley. He had an innate ability to shift from one medium to another in an effortless way and continued to express himself and his cultural background for more than four decades. Really amazing. Um, just a little background on Norman. Um, he was born in 1941 in the community of King Coleth, BC. He learned from his family protocols, um, oral histories um, and ceremonies and had a, an interest in the arts early on. Um, he's conducted extensive research into uh, Niska art and was the foremost Niska artist in wood, uh, precious metals and, and graphics. Um, but the lady of the hour is Vicki Jensen, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you um, a, an amazing photographer, an accomplished art author uh, who has written and published over 50 books. She's been a busy lady for sure. Um, she's been collaborating with Pacific Northwest Coast First Nations communities since the early 1970s to document their lives cultural endeavors and revitalize their languages. Uh, Vicki will take us on a journey of discovery and perseverance. Um, and should any of you have any questions at all, please type in your questions in the chat box. And once her presentation is uh, finished, then we can do some Q and A's. Um, and now it gives me great pleasure to pass it on to Vicki. Thanks, Svetlana. And Welcome everybody to Coastal People's Gallery um, and to a rainy Northwest Coast uh, day here in Vancouver. Um, I came to British Columbia as a documentary photographer decades ago. Uh, early on, Norman Tate uh, asked me to document some of his work. And I did that over the next 15 years. I photographed a lot of Norman's work and that of other Northwest Coast carvers. And at the end of that time period, I, I realized I still didn't know the start to finish process of carving any major piece of Northwest Coast art. And I thought, gee, if I didn't know that, given all the work that I'd photographed, I'll bet there were a whole lot of other people uh, like you who were interested in Northwest Coast art or perhaps carving and uh, maybe had not, not ever done a totem pole. And so you didn't know that process yet. Uh, and that gave me the idea for this book, which began back in the 1980s. Nervously, I called Norman. He was one of the carvers I felt I knew the best and would enjoy working with. But he hesitated when I told him about the idea and then said only, ah, let me think about it. And I remember hanging up the phone absolutely devastated. And I just thought, God, what have I done again? And a week later, Norman Tate called back and he said he'd just gotten a commission to carve 
a massive 42 foot ceremonial doorway pole to the Native Education College. And that was under construction at the time in Vancouver. He said, the job starts immediately. Are you interested? You bet. And he wasn't kidding. Uh, we started the very next day going over uh, uh, to Gibson's to look at the log that had been cut. And that was the beginning of my education. Over the next three intensive months, I learned a great deal about how to totem poles are carved. But I also learned about indigenous teaching styles. Norman was carving with an extended family crew, uh, which was very traditional. I learned to open my mouth less. And for those of you who know me, that was difficult. I learned to open my eyes more and to just know when to stay out of the way, when, to, when it was okay to ask questions. My research project, if you want to call it that, soon grew into a mutual respect and friendship with the Carvers and the family. Uh, we, I listened to their hopes and frustrations. We traded jokes and confidences. And I cooked up enough lasagna and chili to satisfy even the crew's formidable appetite. Later, I found it interesting that Norman told me it was appropriate that I was feeding the crew because in traditional times, anyone who wanted to share in the prestige of a totem pole had that responsibility. And that goes back to old days when chiefs would commission a pole and they would have the responsibility then of housing and feeding the crew for the entire time that it took to carve the pole. So I was part of that. Um, what meant the most to me when the project was done, uh, when I could finally hand each of the crew members their own copy of the book, was that uh, Norman and the crew felt proud of our collaboration. And that was an important word for me, collaboration, because it wasn't just me, it was all of us working on this project. As he said in the foreword of the book, this, it's the printed experience of a totem pole coming to life. So I hope you'll join me now as we're going to take a very brief uh, tour inside the carving shed at UBC as Norman and his crew, as he trained his crew, and as they carved this magnificent 42-foot ceremonial doorway pole. Um, these are only a few of the pictures that are in the book, but uh, hopefully uh, they'll... Uh, give you a sense of what, what was going on. So now we have to do the technology part and uh, see, can you see that Svetlana? Uh, no, yet. okay. You let us share your screen. Okay. Yeah. This is so exciting. Mm, not. <laughs> okay, let's do share screen first. There we go. Excellent. Okay, and we're going to go to full view. Okay, that's a very younger Norman than, than I knew at the end, but uh, so was I back then. Uh, as I said, and as Svetlana said, uh, Norman was Niska. He had already carved the first uh, poles for, the first pole at Fort Edward. Uh, that was back in 1973. Uh, and he would go on to an amazing career. He had also carved the huge uh, pole in front of the uh, uh, field gallery in Chicago. So that was an amazing accomplishment. Here's Norman's crew, very young, very inexperienced, aside from Norman and his brother Chip, who's right standing right next to him on the left. They were the only two of the crew that had ever carved totem poles. Uh, that's Hammy, as we called him, Harry Martin, who's a cousin in the foreground. He knew machinery and, and had carved some masks, but he had never carved a pole. In the background is Norman's eldest son, Isaac, or Ike, as he was known back then. And uh, on the right is Wayne Young, and he was Norman's uh, nephew. Down at the bottom, you'll see this in progress picture of the Native Education uh, Center, as it was called then. Now it's the Native Education College. And uh, perhaps you can see this long, these long two boards going up to the top. There's that little tiny doorway down at the bottom. That's where the totem pole is going to go. 
after the bark is off and the, the uh, back is cut off the log, and you'll see at the very bottom here, there's a coved uh, circle there, a semicircle that takes out the inside wood and relieves some of the pressure to uh, control the cracking or the checking. But what I really want you to look at is this blue center line that's snapped on there. Um, Norman was adamant that always the center line had to be on, whether it was a totem pole or a mask or an add-on piece. And at the very end, you can see where they're just starting to cut the doorway to relieve some of the weight on the pole. Very first stage is rounding the log. Um, I actually called this stage getting the blisters because these young carvers were for the first time using big two-handed adzes that they called the murder adz. Um, later they would switch to lighter one-handed adzes and curved knives and straight knives and chisels, but this is where they're just getting off all the outside wood getting down to the heartwood. And you can see on the left of Isaac there, there's a, a place where they're going to have to cut down through that knot and they just want it to be perfectly round. You can still see that there are some wows on the log there. Here's Chip using a chainsaw to begin cutting the doorway. A lot of people say, well, this is a traditional pole if he's using a chainsaw. And Chip said, well, if we really wanted to go back to using stone tools, we could, but it would be a very long process. And so He's, he called the uh, using a chainsaw just a shortcut. He says, today when I go shopping for groceries, I put them in a plastic bag, not a cedar basket. It's a shortcut. After Norman, well, from the very beginning when Norman uh, submitted uh, his design to the Native Education College, he obviously had, a, had it drawn out. But he then extrapolates those drawings into very large figures and, and works on the placement uh, in coordination with the story that's about this pole too. And then the, the young guys do the tracings. And so they're tracing it so that the tra it transfers to the log itself. This is probably the most magical time, the slide on the left, the first cuts. And that's the first time Norman picks up a chainsaw or any carver picks up a chainsaw to cut into the log. And uh, Chip immediately called the young guys uh, to him. And he said, look, watch Norman. Look at how he holds the chainsaw. Look at how he stands. Look at how deeply he's cutting. He wanted them to notice everything. And that was another that business of looking, of watching, of learning by looking is a big uh, teaching technique. And then you can see on the one on the right, um, how deeply he's cut into that log already. Uh, Norman, as he, for each totem pole he carved, he got more and more confident and made his cuts deeper and deeper. But I want you to also notice this little moon face down at the, the uh, below those cuts. Uh, Norman loved carving moons and he carved many of them. And so this is part of his personal signature on the pole. And another interesting teaching technique he did was to assign each of the young apprentices uh, uh, an add-on piece. For Wayne, that was the killer whale's fin. And for um, Ike, it was the raven's beak. You can see them here, they're sketching it. Uh, roughly on a piece of cardboard and then they're going to transfer that to a piece of wood. The guys later said it was like doing in miniature everything Norman was doing on the big pole. Um, it was also a very interesting psychological technique because Norman made these two young guys, particularly Wayne, who was feeling kind of unsure and uh, almost overwhelmed by the amount of work that was going on. Um, it invested them in the poll and uh, gave them responsibility. Again, here you can see it's now cut, the fin is now cut out of the, the wood and the beak uh, is in the foreground. If you look closely at that beak here, you can see the center line is still on it. And that's what they're putting on here. Uh, Norman couldn't stress that enough with the young carvers, always put your center line in. But once you get it carved to rough shape, 
there's still the business of getting it on the pole. And we used to joke about how they wanted to strap it on or glue it on. But what they did through a process of endless fittings and fidgetings was this mortise and tendon technique that you see at the bottom. But they couldn't just make the hole too big because if you did, then the beak or the fin is gonna wobble. So they very carefully fitting after fitting uh, work to get it so that it was a perfect uh, sink. And finally, I remember the day that Isaac got the beak in. And of course, the first thing Norman said was, now we're ready to get started. <laughs> they felt like they just finished something. <laughs> but now the finer carving, the, the business of fitting, making, sculpting the beak as part of the bird could begin to happen. Here's that moon face again, and it's blocked out. This is the blocking or roughing stage of the pole. And it's, it's interesting, again, how deeply he has carved, but also that you can begin to see some of the shading that's happening, the sculpted sculpting that's happening along the wings here, that that's not a straight down cut. It's beginning to be a slanted in, which gives a sense of depth. But the rest of it is just blocked out. <clears throat> Another teaching technique that I found fascinating and would be terrifying if I was on the other end of it. And later I did join Norman for three years of carving classes and it was terrifying, is that he would show you how to do something on one side. He would draw it and then you had to cut it out or he would draw it. And then in this case, he would use the chainsaw to make a very deep cut on the mouth of the killer whale. And then he would use what he called a cake cut or sliced bread to take out all the big pieces of wood. And he has just passed the chainsaw over to his brother, Chip, who's the foreman, and said, match it. And so that's the teaching technique. And, and you'll see that on First Nations reserves, you know, when you're teaching kids to can salmon, you show them how to measure out a teaspoon of salt in the can, and then you hand them the salt and the teaspoon and you say, match it. So it was remarkable to see, and Norman would sometimes say, I'll show you once, I'll show you twice, and that's it. So watch. I hope you can see a big difference here because things are no longer really blocky. They're starting to be sculpted or rounded. And that's another big stage on the pole when, when the limbs of the figures in particular are getting sculpted. There's not work on the faces yet. That becomes later with a finer tuning of sculpting, but Right now, just looking down the pole, I could immediately see a difference. Whoops. Okay, there's the fine detailing that's beginning to happen. Norman wanted this particular pole to be very traditional with no paint. Um, and so if you're not going to outline the eyebrows or the lips or the parts of the eye in paint, you need to V cut them. And nor, that's what Isaac is doing here with a straight edge knife. And he's just outlining the eyebrow. Perhaps you can see this one over here, if you look very carefully, is already done. And that's going to happen on the eye and other parts of the face. You can see here how thin the fin has gotten. Uh, Norman wanted it to really swoop off the back of the whale. And to that end, he actually uh, took a router and countersank the fin into the pole so that it would get that swoosh. Um, but look at the design that Isaac has put on there. Uh, sorry, that Wayne has put on there. Um, normally, there were five fingers on the hand, and then there's an ovoid in the palm. But what he has done is to carve down three fingers so that hand is giving you the finger. And if you go by the Native Education College, you can still get the finger today. Now, all the rest of the crew was convinced Norman was gonna be on Wayne's case for doing this. And Norman didn't. He thought it was great that Wayne now felt confident enough in what he was doing <coughs> to do this little joke. And there's a lot of times with Northwest Coast carving that there's clever punning or jokes or tricks, if you will, uh, that go on. And this is just one of them. <clears throat> Near the end, you can see how sculpted this pole looks. In fact, this was just a few days before the pole was 
was done. You can see this remarkable carpet of cedar chips that uh, shielded the carver's legs, but also if they dropped a tool, it didn't break. And at the end of uh, one night, they were working long, long hours. And one of the guys uh, climbed up a ladder and he looked at this picture, this pole, and he said to the guys, come, come here, come here, you've got to see this. And they were just overwhelmed at what they would had created before they were just working on individual parts of the pole. And for the first time, they really saw it in its entirety. They were so excited doing this that they missed the last bus going home and had to walk for hours to get there. But um, Isaac said, we didn't care. We were just walking on air. We were so excited at what we had created. However, as Norman has said before, the job's still not done. So throughout the process of these last days of carving, the guys have also been working on their regalia. Other carvers came in and helped them with some of the drawings. The women of the family came in and started cutting out the designs uh, in, out of the melting cloth. And especially on the right hand side, that's um, Grace or Hope as, as she often went by, uh, Tate, Norman's uh, sister who's closest to him. And she was the one who was just leading the regalia brigade and uh, keeping everybody doing what they needed to be doing and on time. This is the poll the day before it was raised as it arrived in front of the Native Education Center. Norman said at this point, it's no longer a log, it's not even a totem pole, it's an entity. Uh, and it will get a chiefly name. Uh, it will be called out in public and announced just as a chief would be announced at the big house three times. And so because of who this pole is now, he said it was very important that the carvers were all there in regalia that's Norman's father and Isaac's grandfather on the left uh, and other family members. Everybody's in regalia. They have learned to sing a Niska welcome song. Um, this was a very important part of the totem pole carving, if you will. Of course, the, the thing that everybody's waited for is for that totem pole to go up. And again, Norman was very serious. He didn't want any machinery. He wanted it to be done as traditionally as possible. What I loved is how many uh, urban uh, First Nations students came to help out. And even some of the guys from the offices across the street came in their suits and helped out. As one guy said to me, this is the only chance I'll ever get in my life to do something like this. And he was right. That is a massive totem pole going up. It's a dangerous time and it was a scary time. And they were directing who should, which ropes should be pulled next, all by drumbeat and by voice. And finally, it gets close to position and it just the elation and the excitement in the crowd became so electric. I wanted you to look up at the top. There's the moon face cradled between the raven's wings. And you can see how narrow those pieces have become, the beak and the fin. And then below, down here, is another of Norman's personal trademarks. This is a little wolf cub that he carved in honor of his youngest son, Micah. Um, when uh, that pole slid into place, it was so exciting. The crowd just erupted. But again, it's not over. And so they quickly erected the dance uh, screen behind. And Norman, there were songs and dances. Norman went up to the microphone and told the poll story. Um, Mercy Robinson Thomas, that you see over here on the right, uh, named the poll. It was called Will Sayak. Balsyat, which means the place where the people gather, which seemed like an especially appropriate name for the Native Education College. And that's Norman's mother on the left, who again is singing a song. And then there were acknowledgments for people who had helped out in this whole process. Norman also, while his mother sang, that's Sadie on the right, uh, Chip beside her, and uh, Norman 
borrowed back his eagle helmet from the Vancouver uh, Museum and had his drum a clutch of eagle feathers and he's singing and dancing in honor of this pole. Take a look at the doorway, the, the carved cedar bark rope that goes around that doorway. They wanted real cedar bark, uh, but realized that probably a carved version would hold up better. And along each of the, there are little hands you can see, uh, and, hand, and a head right over Norman's shoulder. Each of the four carvers uh, without Norman, uh, because Norman signed the pole in other ways, uh, they each carved their face and uh, uh, their hands are holding on to that cedar bark rope. So it's a very important um, doorway. Uh, the last slide here is one that I have a hard time talking about because I know how these guys, these four guys on the crew have changed so much over that three months that they worked on it. Um, they started out not knowing anything about carving for two of them. Uh, and Chip was the only one who had ever carved a totem pole before. But what Norman produced besides this totem pole was a new generation of traditional Niscot carvers. And um, that's pretty important. So uh, that's just a very brief microcosm of the photographs in the book, but I just, it was such a lovely opportunity to take you inside the carving shed and see what a little bit of what I got to see. Over to you, Svetlana, questions? Thank you so much, Vicki. That was so inspiring and educational and, um, you know, how amazing that you were able to document um, such an important project that still stands today in Vancouver and continues to educate the next generation of artists and will for lifetimes. So super excited um, that, uh, that you're here and you were able to, uh, to let us know about that. And now it's time for some Q&A. Um, so let's see what, uh, what questions we have here. We have a lot of nice comments. Uh, let's see. Um, well, you know what, Vicky posed some great questions. And I feel, <laughs> I feel that we should go through them, uh, because it, it gives kind of a further understanding of, of this particular uh, process and project. Um, why would a native artist presume to write about a native experience? Um, uh, like totem pole carving? Okay, obviously I was a non-native art uh, writer and uh, the easiest way for me to answer this is that I posed the question to Norman at the time. I said, are you okay with me writing about what you do? And he looked at me and he said, Vicki, I'm not a writer and you're not a totem pole carver. It'll work. And it did. So, um, but part of what I, did, and I, I love the word collaboration, is that throughout the process of carving the totem pole, I would always bring in contact sheets, the newest, latest version of what I had photographed. Sometimes Norman actually used it to carve a figure deeper, or he would point out something on the picture that he wanted the rest of the crew to really notice. Uh, I transcribed I interviewed each of the crew members individually uh, and also often transcribed Norman as he was teaching. So they all got a chance to look through their transcript to correct anything or change anything that they wanted to make. So what I worked from was exactly what they told me. And then I also asked for three um, native uh, experts uh, to proof the book when, when the first draft was done. And, uh, uh, so I tried as much as possible um, to to go ahead with this idea of a collaboration. Okay. Um, another question was, um, uh, what year and how long did it take? Just maybe refresh our memory. <laughs> okay. Ooh, that's a good one. It was, um, I think the poll went up in huh, 92, I want to guess. I'm lousy with dates. You have to know that. Um, Norman carved his first pole in 1973 and uh, 
and yet, even though the book went up or the poll went up in 1992, I think the book didn't come out for, let's see, am I right here? Nope. The poll went up at the end of the 80s. And then I, it took me five years to print up all the photographs, to go through all the things. We were away on sabbatical for a year. So the book came out in 92. That's how it worked. Okay. And um, just before we left to go on sabbatical, I met with the guys and I gave them sheafs of photographs of themselves and of the crew working it. That was my goodbye gift before we were leaving for a year. And they, unbeknownst to me, um, in a 45 minute uh, burst of energy, carved a mask, the photographer's mask, and I still have it. It's very rough, but it is so perfect because I don't have two eyes. I just have one and that's my camera up here. And my eye is right dead center. Uh, and that's the, 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 I'm looking through the lens. And when this book was launched, the very first edition of the book, which came out in hardcover is where the people gather. Uh, when it was launched at the Museum of Anthropology, I couldn't find Norman anywhere. So this is a last minute panic. Where's Norman? Where's Norman? He, he had asked me also to borrow some of my clothes, which I found unusual. So Yip gets up with a drum and Norman shows up dressed in a wraparound skirt and a blouse and a pair of high heels for God's sakes. And he's got the photographer's mask on and he's dancing around taking pictures of things at the, at the Museum of Anthropology. And every time he stops, Norman or Chip bangs on the drum and you hear this audible click because that's him taking a photograph. So it was such a wonderful surprise, but it was, it was part of that collaboration too. Okay, well, here's another great question. Um, why do a second edition? And is there something new to learn here in this new edition? That's a very good question. Um, first of all, nobody since this book came out has still documented the start to finish process of a poll. And I think that's kind of interesting. People said, well, this is a NISCA poll, but all carvers who carve poles go through similar stages. Uh, and I wanted to, originally I was just gonna tell the story in photographs. And then I added what I heard being said was so important, I started recording everything. Um, so this many years later, what's different? Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make any changes in the original text because that was going to get very expensive for yeah. University of Washington Press. So instead, what I did was to update the last end of the book and my preface. And so I was able to detail all the things uh, that Norman had done, including being presented to Queen Elizabeth and the Lifetime Achievement Award. But the thing that Norman recalled as being the most important uh, was when the elders back home said, Norman Tate is the Oye of our generation. I mean, and that was Norman's great, maybe great, great grandfather who was uh, a very important Niska Carver. So what's different? New cover, but the end parts of the book are different. And there's the ending of Norman's uh, <laughs> Norman's uh, career there too. Uh, Norman died of cancer in, uh, just a few years ago. It seems. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, Vicki, can you potentially touch on um, something about what a collaboration could look like today? If it was done, like how um, it would be different? I think whether it was done back then or done today, the important thing is permission. Um, it may be that the idea comes from a carver themselves uh, or from uh, when Jay and I work on language materials, we are always contacted by the tribal council asking for us to come work on and live on the reserve. So I would say maybe the direction has changed, but sometimes also if we have an idea, we'll present it to the tribal council or present it to somebody 
to see how they feel about it. And that, again, was the very first experience that I had doing that was with Norman and asking him if he was interested. Um, it's, I'll be honest, it's not a popular thing to do these days. And what's really wonderful is that maybe the collaboration involves uh, somebody who is an experienced writer or photographer working with young people uh, in the tribe or the band, if we're talking about groups here in British Columbia, uh, and training them to interview, training them to photograph, uh, uh, helping them through the editorial process. Um, that would be something I would certainly uh, think would be rewarding for everybody. And it spreads the knowledge. That's excellent. Um, there, there was a great question here as well. Um, how have the careers of the carvers developed since carving this pole? And um, I mean, I do have to speak to that. Many of them, unfortunately, have, I think all of them have passed. Except for Harry. Except um, for Harry, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I met, met with Harry or Hammy again uh, at Norman's funeral pot latch up in King Golos. And uh, oh, it was a wonderful reunion. Um, but he has long white hair now, so we've all changed. Yeah, and there was another question about Norman's son still carving. Uh, potentially, um, this particular person is asking about Isaac, and unfortunately, that person he he's passed away at a too young an age. Yeah, far too young an age because um, yeah, if there was a gifted carver, it was certainly going to be Isaac, and um, yeah. I treasure the pieces I have that he made, yeah. Can you refresh our memory? What was the height of the pole? Again, 42 feet. 42 feet. And, and it took about three months, right? From start to finish? Yeah. Right. Which nowadays uh, I've had carvers say to me, geez, they were really moving. At the time, uh, they didn't have a choice. That was uh, the date uh, that the and the Native Education Center was to be open. And I recall it was on Canada Day, so July 1st. And, uh, and Norman was always, so was Chip, very cognizant that they had a finite three-month deadline. And so these guys, unlike an experienced crew, they didn't have their tools, they had to make their adzes, they had to make their curved knives and their straight edges. And so there was a tremendous uh, learning curve involved. Uh, they put in long, long hours, a lot of blisters. They used to have a joke about who was going to be the one that had to buy the next box of Band-Aids. So. Well, that was like an incredibly tall order for a 42-foot pole for, in three months. Yeah. I mean, here in the gallery, we often sometimes commission totem poles that are, you know, eight or nine feet tall and uh, maybe upwards of maybe 15 feet and sometimes it takes you know six months so to have something like that created with so much detail um, is remarkable like it really is remarkable <laughs> um, I, I love documenting this poll I also documented many of the next polls that Norman carved including the three that are in North Vancouver at the Sears shopping mall or whatever that shopping mall is yes. called now those are absolutely brilliant poles. And then he also, I documented one that he created for Stanley Park. Um, and there is a small pole of his out at the Museum of Anthropology outside. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's amazing. He, he did um, really make such an important contribution to the Pacific Northwest Coast, um, you know, culture here and, and really spoke to uh, the, the Niska because they weren't as known as, you know, potentially the Coast Salish that were, you know, that uh, that are around us here in Vancouver and the Haidas, but, you know, the, the Niska have a very distinctive style in their work, uh, whether it's a totem or a mask or, you know, and that hand, um, he, he replicated that hand many times with the middle finger <laughs> in, in, in all media too, which, you know, you know, I love that um sort of uh you know humor in in what he did as yeah. well you know he was serious but you know had a humor behind it which was great 
Norman was always fascinated by skeletal structure and anatomy, and he had a number of anatomy books. I remember when uh, he told Isaac to carve the hands on the moon face, and Isaac kind of looked at him like, where do I start? And Norman just said to him, just study your hands. You've got knuckles, and your knuckles have joints. Look at your fingernails, how they cut in. Just carve what you see. Yeah. And that was always part of Norman's trademark, too. All of his figures had ankle bones and wrist bones, and he liked bones. <laughs> I agree. And that's something where um, oftentimes he created pieces that were transformation works, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from human to frog form. And some of his frogs, many of his frogs actually had human elements to them, and they had those, you know, uh, you know, wrist bones and, and all those interesting features um, that you would never find in a frog, but it was his style and his characterization of the figures and, and how, you know, they linked to the animal world, right? And his moon was um, extra special. We had many moons in our collection and they were always the ones that were the first to, to leave the gallery because people just needed to have those those moons, you know, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, so there was another question about uh, Norman and some of the other forms of media that he works in besides wood. And that would be silver and gold. Um, he worked in graphics as well. And um, we actually still have a few of his pieces in the gallery. Um, right now we have some jewelry pieces that are really unique. Um, and uh, we actually have um, a wonderful mask that's part of our collection um, that was carved by Isaac Tate, his son. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Vicky still has yet to see that piece. I haven't showed it to her, but it's Tuesday. it's a wonderful piece. Yeah. Um, and we have some graphics as well. And they're very classic Niska uh, style uh, that uh, that really characterizes the, the cultural background that uh, that he was a part of. Um, but uh, yeah, I you know, um, I don't see any more questions. So, you well, know, I see Lynn asked, um, oh. where do I buy the book? Oh, where do you buy the book? You buy the book um, at Coastal People's Gallery and um, you can either purchase it on our website or in person. It's coastalpeoples.com. And what's unique here is that all the books that uh, are available will be signed by Vicki, which is a treasure right there right so I encourage everyone to uh, to pick up the book either online if you purchase it online it will be signed and sent to you um, that way um, and you know we're open also 10 to 6 at the gallery here we'd love to to see your lovely faces if, if you could visit and for those who can't that's where we you know come virtually um, but um, so I, I guess just in in closing you know um, you've got to get this book it's a wonderful vibrant read wonderful images and and i feel really blessed that um university of washington press uh approached us on this and uh we felt that this was perfect because we had known norman for for so many decades and uh it was so appropriate that um that we could host Vicki here today and and tell us about uh this wonderful project that she was uh involved with and um and that's about it so i i just wanted to say thank you for sharing thank you everyone from all over um it's wonderful to see your faces i hope you're staying healthy and thank you for joining uh, us today um and you know just a little thought that just allow the power of art and culture to guide you in a positive way and i think that's that's really what uh, a takeaway that i'd like all of you to to have today Thank you so much for joining. And um, I hope to see you one day very soon in person. <laughs> and happy holidays to everybody. Happy holidays. Yes. Yeah. Happy holidays. Take care. All the best. Svetlana, I have a question for you about okay. this whole production. Is it possible to get this um, in a recording that we could share with other people?
Yes, it has been recorded and um, I am, I'm hoping that I've got a good team of staff that can help me edit it properly so that I can, I can release it, I can release the recording. So we're going to work on that. It might take just a little bit of time, but yes, I've, I've had a lot of requests and um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to do that. Yeah, maybe if you wouldn't mind um, sending us an email in that regard, that would be wonderful. Any, any more questions or comments before I before we uh, sign off? Okay. I want to I want I want to go on a tour when we get to go when yes. United States people get to cross the border again. Yes, Vicky, you, I want to go on your tour of all of Vancouver, where all of Norman's totem poles are. Oh, that would be a day. Oh, yeah. That would be super, super fun. And then, yeah. and including Coastal People's Gallery, that of was, course. We are we're going to put that tour together, Vicki. There you go. <laughs> Count me in. <laughs> Thanks, Reva. <laughs> what a great idea. Yeah. There you go, Vicki. See? <laughs> you got more to do. <laughs> Apple Animal okay. Mall, if you want to see the most beautiful poles of I agree. In the city. They I agree. are I go there sometimes just to visit the poles. They're beautiful. Yeah, I agree, Reva. They're amazing. Yeah, I, I do too. I, every time I go there, I just stop right in. I mean, you know, Walmart is not exactly the most exciting place to visit. I, I prefer the toilet <laughs> poles because they're in front of the Walmart. <laughs> Like how did this? How did the store? Like how did they align the, you know, the stores in this, in this? Well, mall? Originally, Walmart was Sears, which it is was why Sears. it was called Sears Center. That's and true. the interesting thing about that is that when the one they cut the back off one of the poles, um, and then you know the poles are held up with an I beam inside. Um, Norman was concerned because he said, well, that's not fair to all those stores that look out on the ivy. <laughs> so he took the back of the other pole and carved it and set, set them up just slightly apart so that those other stores had their pole too. And it was a story about uh, a wolf that snuck into the village. And th at the top of the pole, there's this wolf that's peering over and looking at what's going on. So on this slab, you have the wolf prints as that he's climbing up to the top. It's just a brilliant yeah. pole. Yeah. I'll see if I can find some images and maybe I can share the back. Yeah. Okay. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. And if anybody's interested, all of the images that I've taken of Norman are um, housed at the Museum of Anthropology's um, at UBC at their uh, archives, and it's called the Jensen Powell Fonds. F O N D S is it? F O U N D S. Anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I have. You know, if you ever need permission from me to look at them, just let me know. But I think anybody can go in and request to see those images. Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't even know about that. There you go. I learned something new today. <laughs> Another part of the tour. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, all right. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> what a great idea, yes. Barbara. <laughs> I agree. Thank you so much, Vicki. And thank you so much uh, to all of you for, for staying tuned. And uh, stay tuned for more. Because this is just, like I said, the first of many. Oh, I had a quick question, oh, yeah. Svetlana, for people yeah. who are in the States, um, if they buy the book through Coastal Peoples, can you have University of Washington Press ship it out so that they don't have to pay, it doesn't have to do that cross the border hassle, or can they just order it directly from the University of Washington Press? It wouldn't be signed then, but... I don't think that University of Washington Press goes direct. Okay. They, they have distributors, so because mm -hmm. um, they're publishers, but they're not distributors, and That's they true. work with That's distributors true. to distribute the books. So okay. um, it's really very cost effective because we use Canada Post across oh, the board. Perfect. We yeah. ship like all over the world, so it's not a costly thing to to do from Canada, even though you would think it makes sense from there, but it may be more complicated depending on the distributors. I don't know. Good. Right? I'm glad I asked you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
So from, from us, it, it's the best way because we do this all the time. Okay. <laughs> um, Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay, take care. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Love you, Vicki. Take Thank care. You.